OSI. Um, we are very excited this evening to uh, to welcome Ravashi Dick to the to the Oyoza Center. Uh, Ravashi is a is a very kind, and articulate, brilliant young Tamachacham that I've got to know over the past few months and become friends. And uh, it's a schuss to have him here join our faculty. Um, I also want to. Uh, to, to point out that for many years, the OU Israel Center has had a very successful um, adult education program, as well as a very successful women's learning program. We have many classes that have been designated only for women, and this is really part of a, a, an effort to parallel that and build a, an evening program of men's learning throughout the week here. We already have a very successful uh, halachic chabura that meets every Monday night, taught by Rabbi Ali Dagol, the known as the Smicha Schavi program. Last night we launched a safrut course where we have 18 men learning safrut, and they're going to write their own Megillah Megu uh, Esther this year, Bezad Hashem. Tonight we begin this series in controversi halachic controversies, and tomorrow evening will be the launch of what we're going to do like probably monthly or twice a month, Chizuk evenings. Sometimes it'll be an event here at the center. Sometimes it'll be an outing out in Yerushalayim. We're planning for Kislev. Our next Thursday evening program will be a, a twilight uh, walk through Kibrit Sadiq and Har Zetim. Um, so this is all part of an effort to to it's all part of an effort to to expand the opportunities to learn Torah and to be mechazik one another, and specifically for the men. English speaking men of our community, and it's a great, great school for me personally to be able to partner with our dear friends, the Brachfeld family. Rapilla Brachfeld is here with us this evening and dedicate the Shirim um, and this entire men's based marriage program that we're going to be developing throughout the year in memory of our, of our dear friend, Mrs. Charlotte Brachfeld, who was an active participant in, our, in many of our Shirim and programs here. And, uh, and she's sorely missed by all of us. And we thank the Brachel family for allowing us the schools to be able to dedicate this year and all the men's based medish programming in her, in her dear memory. Without further ado, Ravashi. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. First of all, thank you, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Sam. It's been a pleasure to work with you. I'm very grateful that you have given us the opportunity to uh, do these series of shirim on halachic controversies. Um, before we begin, let's, you mentioned uh, our dear late friend uh, Charlotte Brachfeld, we know her as Lottie Brachfeld. Uh, she's sorely missed. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have, for have the opportunity to have known her. Um, I was asked to start by saying a few words about uh, Lottie Brachfeld. Um, it's a bit challenging to come up to the task to personify who she was, but in a few words, uh, what comes to mind is the Pasuk in Zechariah in Parachas, the futuristic prophet, Vahemet, Vahashalom Ahevi. Now, if you look at the Mitzudis, there obviously the simple translation is that the Navi instructs the people to love. Shalom, to love peace, to love emet, to love truth. Um, but if I could take Madrashic license, and I'm sure this has been done before, the other interpretation is that in the future, there won't be any conflict between emet, the truth, and shalom and, pe and peace. Oftentimes, the two ideals could conflict, right? Some people are very strong about their emet, their sense of truth. Uh, some people, for the sake of peace, will compromise. But in the future, by Emet, by Shalom, Ayavu, Mrs. Lati Brachfeld, at least what I saw, she personified Emet. She was a woman of truth. She's a woman that had real ideals. She had a very clear sense of right and wrong. Uh, she was an inspiration for everybody. By Shalom, she was a woman of peace. She was a gracious and a regal woman. That whole topic leads me to blend this into the idea of great halakha controversies. Um, Gemara in the end of Brachot, Tzav Samach Dalid, 
תלמיד החכמים מרבים שלום בעולם, תלמיד החכמים increase peace in the world. That might seem a bit surprising considering the great controversies in halacha. The Gemara talks about the great disputes between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, the great dispute, the Gemara in Ezu Neshech, the Tanur Achnai, the great dispute between Rabbi Lezer and Agadol Nechachamim. We won't, uh, we're not going to pull the wool over our eyes. There were very great historical halacha controversies, and they at times became very passionate, and sometimes they became very personal as well. But nevertheless, marbim shalom ba'olam, the increased peace in the world. Kol machloket shi l'shem shamayim, if you have a machloket which is l'shem shamayim, which means to say that it's not driven by personal ego, it's driven by the desire to reveal the truth, to ascertain the truth, mitkayim. Uh, because shalom comes from the word of shalem, complete. When you have two distinct entities that merge together to create a more wholesome, a more enriched reality, that is shalom. Okay? Again, as I said from the root of shalem. And it's thanks to these very great controversies that we have enriched our Torah literature. A lot of topics have become clarified thanks to these great, great controversies. The first thing that comes to mind, which I hope God we will get to after we finish some other topics, is the great get of Cleves. Just to illustrate today, the, the great of Cleves was about a certain young individual that the, the sanity that came into question, the Frankfurt Besden had strongly contested to the divorce that was issued in the city of Cleves by Rabbi Shal Lipschitz was the grandfather of the Tiferes Yisrael. The grandson was also of Yisrael Lipschitz. And uh, this generated a huge controversy. However, we now have a rich literature about ascertaining who is considered mentally capable, who's considered has enough uh, mental capacity to issue a get. It has had a strong impact on Gittin that are issued today, and everything else that we're going to talk about, these great controversies, as passionate as, as they were, enriched our Torah, Torah literature. And therefore, you had, obviously, two sides in their strong disagreements. But in the end, right, those two opposing views merged together to create a more complete and a more enriched picture of the halach topic at hand. So that is a manifestation of a emet ve shalom ahevu. Okay, so that is my introduction. Um, again, this limo tribili ilu nishmat, Lottie Brachfeld, um, what was her, remind me, what was the? Shandel. Leo. Basrub Shimon. Basrub we are here tonight because of her. And this should be uh, even a sham. Okay, so tonight the first topic that we're going to be dealing with is abortion. Okay, uh, obviously abortion is a very important topic. If you look at your sheets, I prefaced right the Mar is here. First of all, some of the contemporary ways that had to deal with halachalamai questions that pertain to abortion. If you look there, you have. The first Marmochim, you have the Sri De Eish, Rabbi Chil Yaakov Weinberg, who was the dean of the Beit Medrash Laravonim in Germany. Right? He had taken over from his uh, mentor, Rabbi David Tzvi Hoffman, okay, the Baal HaMalamed Lehoil. Uh, as you, if you look at YouTube, you can see that he was uh, consulted by a doctor. Okay? Now, this doctor, he says, we're talking about Ademet. Right in German, it's Rutland. That in English is German measles or rubella. Um, the German measles. If there are any doctors here, I'm very happy to fill in. If there's any, if anybody wants to contribute with their medical knowledge to complete the picture, uh, German measles is actually a less dangerous version, a less harmful version of the measles. However, if God forbid contracted by a pregnant woman, that will create a serious retardation in the child. In all likelihood, according to British law. Right, this was, again, probably, I imagine, in the 40s, according to British law, uh, if it was determined, or if it was determined that there was a high likelihood that the child, that the fetus, right, uh, would develop severe mental retardation as a result of 
the mother having contracted the measles, the German measles during the pregnancy, it was required by law to terminate the pregnancy. In Germany. Germany. In Germany. This is why they call it This is in England, in England actually. He says, according to British law, this child was presented to Rebbe Chilak of Weinberg uh, in England. This was a British doctor that worked. What years? What years? Huh? Um, it's not clear to me exactly what year this was written in. Okay, the tshuva is shutzri de eish chelak alef simin kaf kuf samuk beis. You do need to look into it because there are various principles shutzri de eish, and sometimes it differs. I, it's not clear to me exactly what the year was. Um, now the issue was like this: the doctor, okay, was required by British law to board the baby. If the doctor did not cooperate, he would be uh, fired. Right? He would be dismissed of his position. He worked for the public medical, uh, I don't know if it was called NHS then, but whatever it was. And his question to Rabbi Hill Yaakov Weinberg was, um, number one, if the baby is Jewish, if it's a Jewish mother that's holding the baby, do I need to abort the baby? If it's a non-Jewish mother, do I need to abort the baby? Do I need to report the fact that, do I need to report the medical condition of the mother and the baby to the medical establishment or not? Because obviously if you reported this, this would most likely lead to abortion, okay? Another contemporary example of this sometime later is from the Tzitz of Eliezer, Eliezer Waldenberg, okay? He was uh, the great Yerushalmi Poisik, was born in 1916. He was the Poisik for the Shari Tzedek Hospital, okay? In Tuff, Shin Lamed Hey, we're talking about approximately 45 years ago, he was approached by the medical director of the Shari Tzedek Hospital, who was a fellow by the name of Professor Meir, did you know Professor Mayer? Did you know Professor Mayer, the general director of Chari Tzedek? Yes. You knew him, okay. You knew him, okay. So Professor Mayer presented the question to uh, the Tzitzileres as follows. Um, they had developed te medical technology to determine, to ascertain that the fetus would have the, the dreaded Tay-Sachs disease. The, the Tay-Sachs disease, as you know, according to the letter of Professor Mayer, in 90% of cases, 90% uh, of the Tay-Sachs cases uh, came up with uh, Jews of Ashkenazic descent, okay, Polish and Russian descent. It was a mostly Ashkenazic uh, disease. It was a hereditary, uh, uh, hereditary disease. Today, they have genetic testing, so the cases of Tay-Sachs have been greatly reduced, but 45 years ago this was a major issue, and the question that was presented to the Tzitz Eliezer is may we abort the baby if we know that the baby will have Tay-Sachs, right? As is known, if a baby, if a child, God forbid, has Tay-Sachs, the child could live three years, four years, maximum dreadful disease, uh, after about a year they would start to be, um, you would start to see a deterioration in the development of the child that had the Tay-Sachs. And uh, it was obviously some, a great uh, distress, uh, anguish for the parents to see the child deteriorate. I should mention there was a Rabbi Adler in Toronto. He was the principal of the Yitzchai Boys and Girls Schools, the last three children or four children to day sex, okay? So the question was, uh, may we abort the baby if it's been detected now? The, it was, according to the letter of Professor Mayer, it was only after three months of pregnancy that it could be ascertained that the baby will likely have Tay-Sachs disease, okay? Uh, the Tzitz of the Ezer wrote a very lengthy tshuva, and he found precedents from the Chavat Yair. And the Yair, I will have a look at these tshuvas, um, because again, I should maybe digress a little bit, the, the, the point of these shirim is not just to hear uh, interesting historical facts. It, I'm hoping that it will generate interest into the case, but I'd like to, as a group, go through all of those um look at all of the references, and as a team, we'll work through them. We're going to actually learn through them. We're going to actually see what these major halakha controversies are about, okay? So getting back to the Tzitzeliezer, permitted abortion until the seventh month. The seventh month is somewhat arbitrary. The reason why he said up to the seventh month is because he said that it is possible to have a viable birth after the seventh month. And he said since at the seventh month, at the time where the mother could already have a viable birth, at that point I won't permit the abortion. We're going to look at some of the marmokaymas. We're going to look at some of the sources to see if there's something to be said about that or not. But he said until the seventh month, he would permit abortion. 
Okay. Um, Rav Moshe Feinstein, as you can see, right, Igros Moshe, it's in Chayish Mishmas, had a base in the Sabbath of Tess, saw this tshuva from Rabbi Waldenberg, and it was written in the journal Asya, okay, I think maybe some of you are familiar with that, and Rav Moshe Feinstein was outraged, okay? Rav Moshe Feinstein was outraged, and Rav Moshe Feinstein generally, right, was a pretty diplomatic rabbi, right? He, he wasn't like the Satma Rebbe or like the Munkacha Rebbe. He generally didn't speak very harshly. But Rav Moshe Feinstein accused the Tzitz of Ezer uh, of nothing less than permitting what he called Ritzich HaMamash. Absolute murder. He says there's a Chacham Echad. He didn't name Rabbi Wanderberg. He didn't name him. He said Chacham Echad there to Saul. There's a certain uh, Chacham in Eretz Yisrael who has permitted Ritzich HaMamash. And he says Vishari Lemara, which means may God forgive him. Okay? Now, Rav Moshe Feinstein does take note that part of what was motivating him was the concern that this would be a slippery slope. Okay? He was concerned about governmental um, interference, uh, and he said that this might set a dangerous precedent. But nevertheless, besides for that being his motivation, he did maintain adamantly that that was Ritzi Chomamish. He said, yes. Yeah. I think it was, this was the year after Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade, yes. Correct. It was becoming a very political issue. Thank you for pointing that out. That is a very interesting uh, historical point, which definitely sheds light in, on the setting of this whole controversy. And he wrote a strong truth. And our Moshe Feinstein was very adamant in his view. He wasn't phased by the Chavis Yoyer. He wasn't phased by the Marid. He wasn't phased by the Yavis. He wasn't even phased by Toysus. Okay. He was so strong-minded in his view that this is Ritzich Mamish that he, right, he held strong in his view and nothing could sway him. If you look at the Shtitz Eliezer and Chelek Yudalit, Simon Kuf, Shtitz Eliezer responded to the arguments of Rav Moshe Feinstein, right, he defended himself vehemently. Uh, this, so this is a bit of the setting of the halacha controversy. They, this halacha, this is a political controversy, but it's also a halacha controversy. Um, it has many manifestations. When I was younger, this was many years ago, perhaps 20 years ago, I recall seeing in a certain journal, I cannot reference it if anybody knows the reference, where a post it was asked about a nine-year-old child with leukemia, God forbid, and his mother was pregnant, and the doctors felt that if they would abort the baby, they could extract some vital components from the fetal sac, from the placenta of the baby, the question now is, can you abort the baby in order to save the nine-year-old, okay? That's the question that the police can have to deal with. Another question, um, in the journal, Menachem Mendel Kasher, the great of Kasher, used to put out a journal, I forgot the name of the journal, uh, a, a, a very prestigious rabbinical journal, Rav Unterman, right? The late chief rabbi of the state of Israel has a very long article and he questions about whether there's, it's permissive, it's permitted to to uh, to perform an abortion. Now, again, I'll digress a little bit, right? Um, we assume, we take it for granted that the term of killing a, a, um, a fetus is called abortion. Okay. Now, it's not a given at all that, that it should be identified as abortion. Abortion has a certain connotation. Okay. I'm not a linguist. If anybody wants to add something about it, but abortion has a certain connotation of discontinuing to do something. Right. It might, if a person thinks of abortion, he might think of a woman having a pregnancy and then deciding, I will discontinue the pregnancy. Right. There's another word for the word, which is feticide. Am I pronounced correct, correctly? Feticide? Okay, so feticide is the connotation, the root is to kill a baby, right? Now, how do you look at it? Do you view it as abortion? Do you view it as feticide? Okay, so I'm just saying that the way you define it, even the name for the act also has certain connotations which in itself is could be subject to debate, right? And part of the mark, yes? The Hebrew name is the same for abortion and for Hapala, yes, the modern Hebrew. I, if anybody knows anything, if Hapala is worth with the root of Hapala, is it something that Ben Yehuda introduced? I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, I have not researched this. Uh, what is the earliest source for referring to abortion as Hapala, right? I'm curious to know that. It's not something that I researched. If that's something, if anybody knows there, Welcome to to uh, to provide us with further information on that. Okay, 
So I'll give you another example. This is something I apologize. I don't have a source for it because I see things and I see a lot of Baruch Hashem and I don't always remember the source. I read that Rabbi Untuman in the journal of Menachem Mendel Kasher, he has a chakira, he questions, can you kill a fetus in order to save the life of a fully developed human being? Okay, I mean to save somebody that is no longer a fetus. Isn't it called the rodif also? Rodif, yeah. The rodif is going to be one of the central things that we're going to have to focus on in order to clarify this idea. Rodif is going to be front, left, and center of this entire issue of abortion. Okay, yeah, we're going to get to that. Yeah. So, the, and, and, and I understand what you're referring to because in that case the child doesn't have the status of a rodif. Okay, which relates back to the similar question that I mentioned before about the nine-year-old child with leukemia, right, where the child with the fetus is not a rodif. Okay, well, okay, but we'll get back to that. And if I recall correctly, Rav Unterman actually says that he was approached by a doctor that had been in the concentration camp, one of the concentration camps. He dealt with a case where a Nazi officer had impregnated a young Jewish girl, which was a violation of Nazi policy, which means to say that an officer could get himself into hot water for having impregnated the young Jewish girl. Um, by the way, they, as I will digress because I do like to digress. Uh, there's a tshuva from the Minchas Yitzchak, which is interesting, right? There's a Mishnah Suvis, right, about a city that had had that see, of a city that had been under siege, right? That the woman of the city, any woman there that is married to a kohen, right, is then forbidden to her husband. Okay, uh, a kohen may not marry a zona. Now a zona. By, by halacha is defined as a married woman, right, that had relations with another man, whether by choice or not. Okay, a kohen cannot marry a zona. So the questions of the is that a kohen, a man had been married to a kohen, a, a kohen had been married to a woman before the war, right? First of all, I apologize that everything tonight is depressing, but uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll get, if you stay with us, I hope that you will stay with us, we will get to other controversies which are less depressing. Some of them are very depressing, this is one of them, I apologize. <laughs> so, so um, the, the Kohen had been reunited with his wife after they had both been in the concentration camps, and now Revais had to deal with the question, is he allowed to be reunited with his wife? And there were cases of Nazi officers impregnating Jewish woman. Okay, unfortunately that was the reality. And this is what the Nazi officer did to the young girl. The Nazi officer knew that there was a Jewish doctor in the camps. The Nazi officer told the, Jew told the Jewish doctor, you will abort this baby. Now the doctor knew that if he didn't comply, he could very well pay with his life. Mm. Okay, I don't know what he did, right? But now after the fact, after this turkey comes to Rav I believe it's Rav I could be wrong, because I, I don't have the source, I couldn't find the source anymore. He comes to Rav after the war and he says, what should I have done? Mm -hmm. right? should, I have should I have aborted the child in order to save my life? So these are the kind of questions that we have to define. And the challenge is that the, the Talmud is very ambiguous about the status of the fetus. The Torah, we do, we'll see now, we'll start the Shia right now by seeing the first reference that we have starting from the Chumash. We're going to now learn all the Marmakomas, or hopefully most of the Marmakomas, that should give us a clear view of how the Torah, how the rabbinic, how the rabbis, the Talmud, how they related to abortion. We're going to see the entire spectrum of opinions, which range, as we've seen from the Tzitz which was very permissive, Right, and you had Moshe Feinstein, which I believe belonged to the other extreme, which considered Ritzich Hamamish, and we're going to see everything in between. Yeah. In Mishpatim, what everyone talks about the, when there's a fight or struggle, there you go. and there's no, it's not considered murder, it's just considered. Very good. So Thank you very fine. much. Thank you for launching us into the first Mar yeah. If you look on your sheet, you see I gave an outline, I divided the shear into into six parts, okay? I don't expect to get through everything tonight. It may take two or three shirim, maybe four, we'll see, right? We're no rush to go anywhere. So I divided up in the shir into six sections. The first section of the shir A is the Gedr, HaUber, and Nefesh, Lomlai. The first thing we're going to tackle, right? E is an Uber defined as a Nefesh, right? A Nefesh, right? How do you translate Nefesh? That's part of the ambiguity. How do you translate Nefesh? Nefesh, soul. That doesn't help us. What's a soul, right? <laughs> Everybody will give you a different answer, right? Kabbalistic, most of the Kabbalistic wisdom 
talks about what the definition of a neshama is. If anybody's familiar with Kabbalistic wisdom, there's five sections to the neshama, right? Ne uh, nefesh, nesh uh, ruach, neshama, chayim. I'm saying it's a very ambiguous thing, but despite the ambiguity, let's ask the question and ask this, is a uber defined as a nefesh? Okay, so which brings us to the first Maramalkum. We look at the Torah, we look at the Chumash, right, in Parashas Mishpatim, right, which is number one, the first Maramalkum. Yeah. So the technical, uh, the real issue here, yeah. does, does the fetus uh, have a stance of the Is he, is he a human being? That's right. We're going to discuss Yerusha, right, which is very essential to the topic. You'll find in your Marmakaymas, I hope that we will get to there sooner or later. We're going to discuss the, 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 the status of Yerusha, right, a very important point that we will address. Okay, so the first Marmakam in Shmois, Perch of Aleph, Pasuk of Beis, right, that's number one. I will read the Pasuk. So this we definitely will read from the sheets. Two men get into a fist fight. Okay? The not for Isha Hara, right? In the midst of their fight, one of the men strikes a pregnant woman. She has a miscarriage. The my Asan, and there will not be, there has not been any tragedy. Mm. Asan, I would venture to translate loss of life. Mm. There has not been an Asan. Honor she on she should be punished. Kasha Yosha Salabal Isha, as the husband places upon him, but not in his payment, that he has to pay, he has to give monetary compensation for having caused the miscarriage. Right, it has to be given according to the ruling of judges. The next passage, if there is a tragedy, I translate, if there is a loss of life, and asato nefesh tachat nefesh, that's the critical part here in the passage. If there is a tragedy, which means Rashi explains that if the woman is slain, right, as a result of this fist fight, that the Torah defines as a son. The Torah defines that as a tragedy, as a loss of life, and then nefesh tach of nefesh, a life for a life. It was done bemazed with hatra'ah, witnesses had seen it, right? then the Allah was nefesh tach of nefesh. So the inference here is very clear from the Pasuk, that it's only if the woman is slain, right, in the midst of this fist fight, you consider it an asoin, only then could you justify the phrase nefesh, Tachas nefesh. The inference is that when there's a loss of a fetus, right, when there's a miscarriage, it's not defined as nefesh. Tachas nefesh. Okay, uh, that inference is stated explicitly by the Gur Arya. You can look at your reference sheet number two, right? He says, "I'll read you the words of the Gur Arya." Nikra nefesh calls man shilo Now that's a very important point, right? Um, that wording is objectionable. You could object to that word, uh, that wording, okay? Because we're going to soon see the sheet of the Rambam, the way Rav Chaim Oizel learned it, that once the woman goes into labor, right, the status of the fetus is greatly upgraded. Right? At that point, the Rav Chaim Oizel clearly understands the Rambam that from when a woman enters labor, which is in itself a topic, at what point is the woman considered to go and is considered to have gone into labor? The Gemara, the Gemara Nida defines it as when she needs to be supported by her friends, that she can no longer, she's in a very weakened state, she needs her friends to hold her up. So when she enters into labor, right, there is a strong case to be made that at that point, the child is considered a fully fledged human being, he can be defined as a nefesh, but the wording of the Bu'ari is like, Nikra nefesh calls man that's already a more radical position, that until the child sees the light of day, until he goes out into the avir, or until he goes out into the into the uh, avir, the air, he's exposed to the air. He's not called a nefesh. Okay, and this general principle, right, is derived from this pasuk. This is our most important biblical source to define the status of a fetus and what the halachic, uh, what is the halach parameter of abortion. Okay. We're going to see another reference in Parshas Noach, right, which is a more 
a covert reference, a more ambiguous reference. We'll get to that very soon. Okay? That brings us next. We get to the Mishnah. We're going to then move on to see the Talmudic sources, and then we're going to see the Rishonim and also all the contemporary sources. One word with Pharaoh. He wanted to kill them when they came out or before. Very nice. Like, Beautiful. Um, we're going to see a Zohar, right, at the end of the Shear, which is at the very end of your reference sheet. Right, that ties the whole issue of paro with abortion, so you're on the ball, oh, right? Okay. So hang in there, it's a good point. But okay? If they came out alive, but that was, yeah. was yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously the, the, the xayr of paro was to kill the borns, the children that were already born. I'm not, that's not under question. Yeah. Right? You're supposed to look at the birthing stool, and that's when you determine whether, the, that's when you know the gender oh. of the baby. So obviously the xayr of paro was to kill oh. living children. But I did like the fact that we're going to see that this whole issue of Paro, that the Zohar praises the Jewish people for having refrained from abortion under those circumstances. Oh. He says that the Jewish people had a motivation to abort their children so that they should not have their children thrown into the, uh, into the river. And they refrain from abortion. The Zohar considers that one of the merits that had them... Moses' yeah. father left. That's right. He separated from his wife. So I guess one, one solution was to separate. Right? The other solution was to abort the babies. Right? Miriam had criticized her father, Amram, for having separated from his wives. But what they did refrain from was abortion. It's not something that they engaged in, despite the mortal danger that existed to the babies that were born. Okay, now that leads us to the Mishnah Nida Daf Mem Gimel. Says the Mishnah Tinok Ben Yoav Echad the Har The Mishnah says that a child, once he's one day or one day he's one day old, if somebody uh, murders the child, then he's committed a capital punishment. He's subject to the death penalty. Okay. But it's thirty days no more. Oh, so that's a good point. Look at the Teferis Yisrael there in the Mishnah. The Teferis Yisrael it means to say that if you know it's a viable child, which means to say that you know that the woman had a full-term pregnancy, okay, that means that the child is assumed to be viable. Right? Today, doctors could mostly ascertain exactly when the termination, when, what, what is a full-term pregnancy, they can determine when the child, be, when the mother uh, conceived. Um, but in the times of the Talmud, there was always, they didn't know exactly when the time of conception was, and therefore they didn't know, did this woman have a full pregnancy, did she not have a full pregnancy, so therefore if somebody kills a baby and you don't know if she had a full pregnancy, you cannot subject him to ex execution because of a technical reason. You don't know if this was a viable child or not. I need somebody to tell me the time because time is all right. We good. Some time. We're good. Okay, somebody will have to uh, let me know. Yeah, because okay. All right. So yeah. So but but says the 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 Teferis to show that we're dealing with a case where a, where a couple had been together, they had had relations, and the husband may have gone overseas. Okay, and uh, we can know that this woman didn't become. You know, can determine the time of conception. We know it's a full-term pregnancy. If we could determine that she had a full-term pregnancy, that means the child is viable, and if somebody kills a child that's even one day old, he's committed a capital, he's committed a capital offense, that's considered full-fledged murder, and he could be executed in a basin for having done that. Okay? So, obviously, the first thing that jumps out is yom echad, right? The capital offense is when the child is one day old. The Gemara, right? This is more important. What the Gemara has to add to the Mishnah, the Gemara and the Achmendalit, in your reference sheet number four, says the Gemara. How do we know, Bahar Gachayev, how do, what is the biblical source that taught us that if you kill a baby even one day old, that that's a capital offense? Dichsiv, it says in the Pasuk, the Ish Kiyake Kol Nefesh, I'll complete the Pasuk, the Ish Kiyake Kol Nefesh Adam. Anybody that mur murders any nefesh adam, a human soul, mot yumot, he's subject to the death penalty. Okay? So you see, how do we know that a baby that's one day old is a nefesh? Right? How do we know that you could be c considered to have committed a capital offense? Because the part says, kol nefesh. Kol nefesh adam, any nefesh, anybody who fits the definition of nefesh adam, namely a one-day-old baby, if that child is killed, then mo'i tumor. Come on all the Rishayim. We're talking about about 20 Rishayim over here. Okay, so this is the, definitely the strong consensus amongst the Rishayim. Okay, the Ramban, right? 
makes the immediate diuk, I'll read the Lashon of the Ramban, you can see the Lashon of all the other Rishayim, a very similar terminology, says the Ramban, Alpha Uber, but it's only a fetus, by inference, the Lakrina Bazena Fish Adam. You cannot be subject to the ex to the punishment of execution by having killed a fetus because it's not an Fish Adam. Here. Okay? This same deal is made by the entire basement Russia, the Ramban, the Rajba, which is aligned with the Ramban very much. The Rajba was a student of Rabbi Yaina. Rabbi Yaina was a Mukhutin with uh, with the Ramban, they greatly admired each other. The common thread between the Ramban and the Rabbein Yoyin is that they have gone to France to receive the Chachma, the, the Torah of Ashkenaz. Right? They took, the Balitosas were uh, very sharp Talmudic analysts. Right? Their, 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 their logic was razor sharp. Right? The Ramban and the Rabbein went to France to learn that Chachma, brought it back to Spain. Okay? Uh, they were Mukhutanim, the Rajba, the Ritva, who also belonged to the base Medrash, to that school of the Ramban, the Ran. Right now we get into the school of the Rosh. The Rosh was a French scholar that later came to France. The Rosh, they all served the same thing in Spain. Yeah, he came to, what did I say? He left France, he came to Spain. Yeah, which is actually very interesting. I'll get off on a digression. Uh, the Rosh in France had to put on Tfilin and Chalamoid. Because right, that the reading, the diet of the Yerushalmi, right, there's a Rashi like that on the, in the Torah, a fascinating Rashi. There's a discussion if anybody learns that Yomi, as the Gemara in Sukkot discusses the end of Sukkot, where you can make one, if you do a number of mitzvot, can you make one bracha? Says Rashi, for example, Sukkah, Tfilin, and Lulu. So the Kivei was Medayah from Rashi, so you see that you put Tfilin, at least Rashi held that you put Tfilin on a Chalamet, which is not a big novelty. Rashi lived in France, in France that was the, well, there's a Ri Hazak, and it was like that you put, uh, the Rosh came to, so he had to run away because the Maram Rutenberg had already been, been incarcerated. The Rosh was the next target. He had to stay in France, he came to, to, to Spain. The Rajba had received the Rosh. And he said, what's going on? Why are you not putting on Tfilin on Chalamoy? And he changed the custom in Spain, which is really remarkable if you think about it. Somebody comes to another country and says, I want to totally change the Minog of Makkum. That's something I find quite surprising. Okay? But in any case, the Marit says the strongest. The Marit is Revesif Tarani, the son of Moshe Tarani. He was not, didn't belong to the Tukufa of the Rishonim, he really belonged to the Tukufa of the Achrayim, but he's considered, from the G'dayla Achrayim, is considered from one of the very early Achrayim. As you can see, he was born approximately in 68, so we're talking about a very early and important Achrayim, right? He says it the strongest, if you look at your reference sheet number 10, he's Medayi Gilgamara, it says, Kol Nefesh, L'Rab Eskot Abayi, the Pesach says, Kol Nefesh, any soul, Right, the mashma kol nefesh, afilu nefesh kol do. Anybody who has even a most minimal, anybody that could fit even the most minimal definition of nefesh, namely a baby that's one day old, right? If you kill him, that's a capital punishment. Comes the diuk alma. We see we can infer the fallen. Afilu nefesh kol do lemikri. Afilu nefesh kol do lemikri. He's not considered a nefesh on any level. Afilu nefesh kol do lemikri. Right? Rav Moshe Feinstein, right, who represented the opposite, the polar view, right, obviously had to be very dismissive of this marit. Okay? The marit, a little bit contra contradicted himself. This is the marit that appears in Simit Sanitet. In Simit Sadizai, there's another chuva from the marit where he contradicted himself. Rav Moshe Feinstein said, How dare you invoke the marit when he contradicted himself? Okay? That was Rav Moshe right now. That was the attitude that he took because of his strong minded view on abortion. Okay? Fair enough. We'll see other Rishayim. This brings us to the next important Mishnah that relates very much to the status of the of the over. Ahalot, Perik Zayin, Mishnah Vav, very important Mishnah. I, please, if you can have a look in your reference sheet number 11. Ha'isha Shimak Shalele, a woman who is going through a very difficult childbirth. She is in mortal danger. Says the Mishnah, you cut up the child in the womb of the mother. Oh. You cut the womb into pieces. Um, I could be corrected, but I believe, I mean, I think that abortion, 
right, is executed by actually sticking a device into the uterus and cutting the child up into pieces. I'm not sure if that's the it way it's called that. It depends on what stage, but I think at the later stages of abortion, that's what basically they do. If, excuse me for being blunt, and if anybody, uh, I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a, you basically take a pair of scissors and you cut the child, okay? That's why I said that abortion, feet aside, right? There's, there, is, there is importance to how you actually define what, what abortion is. But in any case, but that's exactly what's being described during the Mishnah, to take a knife, and to insert the knife into the into the uterus and basically cut up the child. Okay, mm -hmm. that is in order to save the mother from mortal danger. That would be rodev. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Correct. That's the question, which leads us to the topic of rodev. Uh, continue the Mishnah. This is a very critical phrase of the Mishnah. Her life takes precedence over the life of the fetus. Yotzer Ruba, but once the child. Mm -hmm. has exited Rubai, the Mishnah Anita defines that if most of the head has come out, because the head is considered the most important part of the body, right? Once the head has been, uh, once the fetus has exited his head, then you invoke the principle of um, oh, no. It's actually Rubo, not Correct. It doesn't say Rosh Hashanah, it's a discussion in the Gemara. Oh, because often well, a difficult pregnancy might be a breach birth. Yeah, breach birth, correct. And it's not coming up. Exactly, correct. Right, so that's the discussion in the Gemara, a lengthy discussion in the Gemara. Nida, how do you define Rubai, right? And there's discussion back and forth, right? Obviously, it's not our topic, but the bottom line is is that, if, that according to most Rishayim, once most of the head has been exited, that could be defined as Rubai, okay? Now, what I find interesting is now, you may have, somebody might find it a little bit unusual. We brought here the parish of Mishnah. He says the Rambam calls it Bar Vanochain, Vein Sarach Parish. This is the Mishnah. It's completely understandable. I don't need to add anything. It's self understood. Which we'll see is quite shocking because the Rambam Mishnah Torah takes a very, very peculiar view on this whole issue, which is in contrast with all the other Rishayim. And this is one of the great enigmatic Rambams. Okay, the Rambam on, on abortion is one of the great mysteries in the Rambam. To speak to any brisk or anybody who is busy with Rambam, think of the five most difficult Rambams, or the, five, or the Rambam that generated the most discussion because of its great difficulty. This, I would reckon, I would put my money to say that this is the Rambam that might come up first. Okay? But, this, but interestingly enough, here the Rambam Parish of Mishnah says this Mishnah is very clear. And in fact, it really is, should be, it should be very clear, as all the Rishonim say, right? First of all, if you look at the Mepharshim of Mishnais, the Tosis Yom Tov, the Teferis Yisrael, I believe the Bar all the Mepharshim of Yom Tov are basically all on one page in this. The mission is very simple. When the baby's inside, he's not defined as an Ethesh, or he's not defined as a human being, so therefore the mother's life takes precedence to the fetus. Once the child has stuck his head out, so now he's a fully-fledged human being, so therefore, you invoke the principle of nefer, ein dach nefesh, mitnei nefesh. What could be simpler, right? Now, this brings us to the Gemara and Sanhedrin. I made a very important commentary on this Mishnah, right? The discussion there of the Gemara and I Beis of the Beis is the din of Rodev, okay? The Gemara raises the question, okay? Let's call Reuven and Shimon, the classic Reuven and Shimon scenario. Reuven is chasing Shimon. Reuven is attempting to murder Shimon. Right? The Din of Rodev, you kill Reuben. The most famous case, I believe, in Tanakh of Rodev is when um, Abner right, was being chased by Asael. Asael was attempting to murder Abner. Abner, an act of self-defense, killed Asael. Uh, Asael's brother, Yoav, right, is enraged. Right? And he believes that he has the duty of Goel Hadam and eventually kills Abner, which basically ended the which basically, from then on, David and, uh, and Yoav were, had a very complicated relationship. Anybody who's a Bakhti and Tznach knows the Sefer of Shmuel, which is a fascinating Sefer. Um, I could recommend as a book, The Beginning of Politics. It's a fascinating, uh, fascinating um, perush, a commentary on the book of Shmuel. Anybody who's interested in reading the Tznach, um, Avner says I was doing it as an act of self-defense. 
Yoav said, you could have saved your life by simply taking one of the limbs of Asael. You didn't need to kill Asael. You could have simply severed one of his limbs, and therefore you had no justification in killing um, uh, Asael. Okay, that's the, that's the source of Tanakh that relates to Rodef, okay? Much we have in the Torah the case of Rodef, right? In Zorach al Hashemesh, right? Mm. That's the more I should really talk about the Torah before getting to Tanakh. But uh, the question of Gemara is, does the Rodef need a warning? In other words, normally you don't subject somebody to an execution, execution of Bezal, unless he's had a trial, unless he's had a warning before. If Reuben is chasing Shimon, can you kill Reuben without warning? Okay, so the Gemara says that you don't need a warning, right? So Amra Abuna, Katan Haroidev. So if it's a child, a child cannot be warned. A child does not, does not have the mental capacity to be considered warned. Doesn't have the mental maturity to appreciate the warning. So therefore, there's no such thing as hatra'a for a child, right? So the question is, can you, the cotton roid definitely let's see the benafsha, but nevertheless, the cotton still has a case of where you have a child who's chasing somebody else to kill. Reuven is a child, he's attempting to kill Shimon, you can kill the child. The child has the status of a rodef. The Gemara says this is a proof that you don't need hatra'a, you don't need to give warning to the roidif before killing him. The question now comes from the mission all that we read. Once the child sticks his head out, you don't touch him because his life and her life is on equal footing. Vamai roidifu, he's a roidif, he's endangering his mother. He doesn't have the status of a rodef. Right? The woman is being pursued by heaven. Okay, that is a vague statement. What does it mean that he's being pursued by heaven? The Rambam the Mishnah says, Tif right? Olam. This is the natural course of things. Right? It's considered a natural phenomenon that if a woman is in labor, at times she could be subject to mortal danger. So therefore, that's not called rodif. When something is part of the natural course, it not, doesn't have the status of rodif. Okay? So, what matters to us is that the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin Daf Ein Beis determined that right, the child does not have the status of rodif. Clear enough. So, which only reinforces the classic interpretation of the Mishnah. That when the child is in the mother, he's not an Ephesh, so you can kill the child. Once the child sticks his head out, there's no justification, kill, the justification of killing him. He is a fully fledged human being, and you cannot kill him on the basis of Rodif. He's not a Rodif, Mishamaya Karad Is that clear? Should be clear, right? I point you that this is an interpretation of Rashi, the Yad Ramah, the Midiri, the Piskirid, the Taisi Samdo, the Teferis Yisrael. That was the Rishon and Joy in the school of the Ramban and the Rajba and the Ran and the other Shad that we saw before. They all said explicitly at Uber Lad Nefesh. He's not a Nefesh. Okay? So we want to count on Rishonim. We have at least about a dozen Rishonim at this point that have all explicitly stated that the fetus is not a Nefesh. We want to get to more to the Chronim. Right? This is a halacha appears in Tav Chav Hey at the very end of Chayshin Mishpat. Okay? We're jumping ahead of our game, right? We started this year with the very end of Chayesha Mishpat, okay? So, you have the Lavush, states it explicitly, the Sma, right? The Noyed of Yehuda, right? Gives his backing to the Sma. The Aruch HaShulchan, and other Chorayim that I could invoke, right? They all say the same catchphrase, Uber Lav Nefeshu, and Uber is not a Nefesh, right? Um, if this was it, right, we could all go home. The problem is the Rambam. The Rambam in Mishnah Torah, which will be the second section of our shir where the Rambam throws a wrench into everything. The problem is, is the Sri Aish did wish to suggest that we could maybe ignore the Rambam because we can follow Rabbi Shai. And the problem is that the Shulchan Aruch and Tavchafe copies the wording of the Rambam. Okay? So I'm putting that on hold. Right, the second section of the will deal with the sheet of the Rambam, but thus far we have determined the sheet of most of the Rishayim, and most of the Chorayim too, but overlap Nefesh. Which brings us to the next very important Gemara. So which saying is saying that, that what, yeah. are the, what are the implications of that? Is There's that huge implications. Nice. If you want to the impli- Yeah, I'll give you an example of the implications. Let's discuss the case that we began this year with. 
right? Nine-year-old child has leukemia, right? They need some of the stem cells of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the placenta, right? Can you abort the baby? Presumably, yes, right? Because if the child, if the fetus is not an nephesh, plain logic dictates that it's worthwhile to take the over's life, which is not a nephesh, right, in order to enable life for the nine-year-old child. Another example, the case that we dealt with with the doctor in the concentration camps, right, he's being ordered to perform an abortion. He knows that if he disobeys, he could pay with his life. It's the same thing, right? Plain logic dictates that if the fetus is not a nephesh, that it would be justified for the doctor to perform the abortion. Okay? So far, so clear. Right. Yeah. Not only, not only would it be justified, but one might argue that he should. Correct. Thank you for pointing that out. Well, that's one clear. I, I, I'm not sure what you, excuse me, I don't know your name. Jeremy. 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 Okay, so Jeremy pointed out that not only does the, the halacha of leisamad al dam reacha, right? A person has a lachic obligation, it's a chiyu daraisa, that if you could save a life, if a person fails to save a life when he could, right? He, uh, he violates the, dic the dictum of, of the Sam Dada Echa, as you pointed out, which reminds me of another controversy that I hope God willing to get to eventually in this series is the topic of organ donation, okay, which very much relates to the issue of the Sam Dada Echa. Okay? Sorry, if you want to drop Ultiman, did, did he give his advice? Sorry? Drop Ultiman, did he give his advice? I don't advice? know. I don't remember. Avonchuman raises the question in, his, uh, in, in, in the journal of. Kasher and he brings the case. Again, I should I should be I should like to to emphasize what I said before that uh, I say this with a bit of hesitation because I don't remember who was Urban. I, I, my memory tells me it was Urban Turman. Okay, and I couldn't find the source. I mentioned that um, um, Mr. Brachfeld, Harry Brachfeld, talked about a case that you mentioned to me from Rabbi Swag. Okay. From Rabbi Tzwai, who was the was the Rabbi of Antwerp, yeah. right? Where he had to also write a truth about about performing abortions for child children that were liable to be born with serious birth defects. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So that's another question that we'll that we'll have to address. Okay. So moving on, this is things of the Gemara in Eruch and Zayin. This is a very important Gemara for the topic of abortion. Um, I, can't, I almost cannot get overemphasize how important this Gomorrah is in order to shed light on this whole topic. Okay? So I'm, I, I hope that it's clear. If you look at reference number 24, if I may, I'd like to go through the Gomorrah together. Okay? I don't want, I, I'm trying to make everybody active participants and not merely passive participants. So let's have a look at this Gomorrah together and let's see what we can glean from it. it says the Mishnah. Of Zion, of Aleph, and Erech, and Aisha, she yells the heart of a woman is being taken out to be executed. Ain, Mamtina Lacha Tayled, surprisingly, you don't wait for, him to, for her to give birth. Right? One could argue and say, look, the woman is due any day, let's wait till she gives birth and execute her. Surprisingly, why? Why don't you wait? Inu Hadin. It's considered cruel, right, to keep somebody waiting for his execution. You know, I didn't. That means to say that the halacha, the, the, the ruling of the Beitzah, has to be performed without the considered out of part of her body, and that's the other reason. Yeah, that's right. Very good, correct. It's considered part of her body. Says the Mishnah, but if she's already gone into labor, which means she's sitting on the birthing stool. Then you do wait. Oh, you do wait. Then you do wait. You do wait which means to say this already leads us, this might. It was an Uber who waited. Sorry? It was an Uber when you waited. Well, she's in labor now. Okay? Oh. She's in labor, which we'll see, right, very much supports the pin that we'll soon see as the pin of the Rabbah of Chaim that once a woman goes into labor, mm -hmm. then the child has, 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 uh, she has received a certain level of, ton of autonomy and he's no longer a uh, limb of the mother. He could be a full fledged life. Mm -hmm. Haij, okay, so I'm not going to get into the other topics here in the Gemara. Let's skip to the Gemara, right? Um, Pshita. The Gemara says this is obvious, right? Isn't that interesting? It is obvious that you don't wait for a woman to give birth. Says the Gemara, no, gufa, right? It's part of her, part of her body, right? It's funny that that you know the, the more liberal refrain is that it's a woman's body, right? That's the pro-abortionists will say it's a woman's body. I cannot completely dismiss it. I have a Talmudic source for that. 
She can do what they want, exactly. They take it to the next stage and say, since it's her body, she can do what she wants. Which, which means to say, in halacha, actually, we don't, we're not permitted to do what we want. I'll, again, I'll get a little bit of a, a digression, which will relate back to abortion of Moshe Feinstein. Okay, I believe it's a Simen Tzadi, Chil Gimel, or Chaim Chil Gimel, Simen Tzadi. There's a fellow he wants to fast to him Kippur. And if he takes a shot, if he gets an injection, he'll be able to fast to him Kippur. So the questionnaire was, the, 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 the questionnaire came with the Anoch that that's the right thing to do. He was asking Moshe, is he mechuyif to do that? Is that an obligation? Comes from which says, he's not obligated to do that. In fact, it's forbidden to do it. The Gemara in Baba Kama, the Tzadi, it says that you're not, there is an Isra Chabala, you're not allowed to bruise yourself, you're not allowed to injure yourself. He says, if there's a medical need, we have a heter to take injections. We have a heter to bruise ourselves, okay? But he doesn't have to fasten in Kippur. He's ill, he's elderly. So that there's no justification to bruise himself with an injection. Interesting take, the Ravosha says. So, an yes. Injection of what? Whatever it was, they would inject it with some sort of, uh, anybody as a doctor, they can fill in what sort of injection would enable a person to fast, but that wasn't really the question. There was something that they could inject the person that would give, that would enable the person to fast on Yom Kippur. They would do an injection before Yom Kippur, and that would boost some of the vital, some of the vital nutrients that the person needs, and then you'd be able to fast. Okay, that was the case, and Ramesha actually said it's forbidden to do that. Which leads us to the Marit, we'll soon see the Marit. The Marit actually learned that the sort, that the prohibition of abortion is actually because of Chabala. Right? The reason why abortion is forbidden is because it's a unjustified um, act of injuring oneself. Okay? But in any case, the Gomorrah stays explicitly. It's not murder. What? It's not murder. It's not murder. The Gomorrah seems to be pretty strong about this, that Gufa, that it's part of her body. To the point that the Gemara said that the mission didn't have to tell us that. The mission didn't have to tell us that if a woman is being executed, that you, have, that you don't wait for her to give birth. It's so obvious, right? The, 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 the fetus is part of her body. So the Gemara says, Itzrich, right? I might mistakenly think that I might mistakenly think that it's not part of her body. It's the property of the husband, as we saw in the Pasuk before, that if there's a fist fight, a man causes a woman to miscarry, he has to give monetary compensation to the husband, which might lead me to mistakenly assume that the fetus is property of the husband. See how that goes down in progressive circles? Okay. I might think, but it's a mistake, what was actually maybe we're not justified in destroying the property of the husband. So therefore, um, so therefore we're told, or says, one minute, what? that sounds like a pretty good argument. Hey, wait a second. Indeed, right? What permits the basin to execute the woman and kill the fetus and take the property of the husband? It's actually pretty smart, you know, the Gemara says, what's the Havamino? The Gemara says, it's such a good Havamino, why is it not actually correct? There's a special biblical source from which we expound that indeed, in principle, we should have not executed the, the fetus, it's the property of the husband. However, the Pasuk says, there's an, there's an implicit instruction from the Torah that both the fetus and the mother have to die. Okay? So which is a really critical point. We've just laid down two principles. Number one, the fetus is part of the mother's body. Number one. Number two, it's property of the husband. Okay? Two important principles gleaned here from this Gemara in Erevin, Daf, Zayin. Okay? Now, Fast forward, right? Um, let's see a little bit more of this Gemara, another important Gemara. Amar Rav Yehuda, moving down a few lines, okay? In your sheets, we're talking about about, about eight, 10 lines from the, from the top, right? Moving ahead a little bit more. Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Shmuel, okay? This Gemara, I found shocking. Again, we're getting back to the case of woman's being taken out to be executed. And what you do is you actually, you strike the, 
the, I suppose, the tummy of the woman. Oh, you abort the baby. Okay, you abort the baby, exactly. Oh, wow. You abort the baby. Kedei shiomot avat chila, so that the woman should not be executed whilst the fetus is alive. Kedei shloi tovenei nivu, this is fascinating, to save the woman from disgrace. Mm. Right? We're talking about post-martyrum disgrace. Right, the Rashi explains it, the Rebbe Gershom says it more explicitly. What happens is if there's a living fetus, when the woman's executed, the fetus will come out, there's going to be blood, it's going to be messy, right? It's going to look very disgraceful for the woman, even though she's already dead. In order to uphold the dignity of the lay woman, we do an abortion. So the Mara says that we resort to abortion to uphold the dignity of the executed woman. That is the instructive here in the Gemara, fascinating. Okay. So the Gemara says, the Gemara says, why do you need it? Why do the Gemara seem to have received the medical fact that, the, that when a woman dies, the fetus dies before the mother? Mm -hmm. so the Gemara says, this is another critical piece of information. There are many critical pieces of information here. Right? A fetus has the capacity to receive an inheritance and not only that to pass on an inheritance. Okay? Which is another very important point, which actually tells us that the fetus has monetary rights. Which we'll see soon is one of the sources as to why abortion could be forbidden. Right? Because if the child has monetary rights, right, his right to live or his right to go out, his, his right to eventually be born is no less than his monetary right. It's uh, uh, Yes, we'll see that soon. Yes, yes, yeah. I jumped ahead of the game. Is that the, the Lush is on your flat here? It's yes, the Lush is Tinnum. Yes, I jumped ahead of my game. You pointed that out. That's very correct. We're going to soon see in the Gemara Baba Basra when we get to maybe this year, maybe I don't know, this year, next year, we'll see the Gemara Baba Basra, Dafka from Mbeis. We'll see, we'll talk, we'll get into the whole discussion of the monetary rights of a fetus. What monetary rights does a fetus have? That will be a very central discussion. Mm -hmm. I think we need to stop here. But okay. the fetus is considered like a property then? It's the property, yes, so they're both true. On one hand, you look at the fetus, um, uh, uh, the reason, okay, just sorry to, to interrupt, the reason why Tinuk will see that the Mars is in principle, we'll see in the Kamen Gomar that the Mars talking about Tinuk because of a technical reason. Right, because a fetus always dies before them. Okay, this is we're left on a cliffhanger. Okay, which is great because I hope that means everybody will come back no, next week. No, okay. <laughs> okay, but uh, that we're gonna have to start. But in our days, the baby yeah. you can have the mother who dies, and now you can save the baby. They've done that sometimes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So good. We're left off here. Cliffhanger. Next year sure we're gonna have to start this good morning Irish and again. Okay. I, if anybody wishes, I encourage people to uh, to go through this good morning Irish and learn it well. It's, a, it's an important. Have them take the source sheets to try to hold on. To them. Yes, please. Hold on. Uh, please hold on to the source source sheet. Can we say a kaddish? Yeah.